Amen. If you have ever bought a house, you're familiar with the process of identifying your needs in a house and figuring out what your high priorities are. Which, which needs are high priorities, which things are low priorities. And usually in a, in a housing market like ours and bigger, there are many houses that are for sale. And so which one is for you? Do you, you look at price, that's a high priority. You look at location, that's often a high priority. You look at the age and condition of the house, you consider that. What priority should the size of the house be? How about the floor plan or the number of bedrooms and bathrooms? The size of the yard and the, and the overall property? Does it have a garage? And there are many other things that we could talk about as being important to people. Priorities and which one is, is more or less important, which one's a deal breaker, which one is completely unimportant. Years ago, we looked at I think just about every single house in Grand Forks and East Grand Forks that was in our price range before we finally found the house that we end up, ended up buying, it was months of looking and it got a little bit old because we, we would dedicate hours just about every week looking at houses and you start questioning like, is the right house out there? Maybe, maybe this priority that I have is too high and I'm ruling out houses because of it that that I shouldn't, should I, should I adjust my priorities? You know, can't we make this house work or this one? Is that priority really that important? What if we, what if we tweaked our priorities a little bit and then, and then there might be more houses that we could potentially buy? And sometimes adjusting your priorities like that is, is a good thing, but only if your priorities were wrong to begin with. If you concede on some truly important priorities and just buy something, you'll end up locked in, in many ways, um, to a house that you either don't like or it doesn't meet your needs. And if we're talking about, you know, I should have gotten the more expensive car wash instead of the less expensive one, making a purchase like that isn't that big of a deal, but a house with a, a mortgage and hundreds of thousands of dollars Usually these days, that's, that's what we're looking at. You, you really want to make the right purchase. And you would, maybe we would say buying a house that doesn't meet your needs or one that you don't like is maybe worse than not buying a house at all at that time. And we could talk about marriage being that way as well. Having priorities, having things that are important and marrying the wrong person is worse than not getting married at all. It, it really is. It's a life decision more than a house is. Maybe your, your job, where you work, and you, you went to work at the wrong place with the wrong uh, set of conditions maybe, and that was, that was a poor decision. You change your priorities. What church you're a member of, where you live, that sort of thing. These big life decisions can be this way. But Getting back to a house, once you buy the house, you know that you'll have to maintain it. It will take some maintenance. You may even purchase it knowing of certain things that need to be improved. Some people like building fixer-upper houses with that in mind. It's cheaper because it's in disrepair, and they go in knowing that they're going to have to put work into it, and they're planning on doing that. If you, but we know that if you, it doesn't matter what you own, if you don't maintain it, eventually that thing will deteriorate and degrade until it's completely destroyed. That's, that's what time will do. Zero maintenance eventually brings total destruction. You'll have to continue to put in work to keep what you started out with. Even better, if you put in the work, you can end up with something better than what you started out with. Leave it better than when you found it. Is a, is a great motto to have, but it takes maintenance, it takes work. And relationships are this way as well. They take maintenance. We've been talking on Wednesday nights about fellowship, and fellowship is part of relationships, and so we need to approach fellowship with this kind of care and attention. And tonight, we're going to finish our series on fellowship by considering building and maintaining fellowship, building and maintaining fellowship. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would teach us tonight. Help us to be diligent and careful and observant to notice 
where we need to maintain our relationships and then diligent to do it. Sometimes we can set it and forget it and when things need maintenance, they'll, they'll deteriorate with that approach. Help us to build and maintain our relationships and our fellowship. And I pray that you'd be glorified in all of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First of all, let's talk about build, building fellowship. Similar to buying a house, you and I choose what relationships we will have in our lives. And I, I'm always amazed to think of it how every area of our life, ultimately, we are making choices. And we often feel like it's being pushed upon us, but we end up either giving in to that pressure when it's something's being pressed upon us. We give in to that pressure, and that's our choice. Or we say no to that pressure, and that also is our choice. And when we have relationships in our lives, we are choosing to have them and allow them. And there are many priorities that we may have that influence the relationships that we choose. And here are some, some priorities that we can have. We can have the priority of companionship. And we can think, you know, I am lonely, and so I'm seeking a relationship, a friendship of some kind. Uh, we, we can have instruction as a priority. I want to grow, and that can be a reason for the relationships. Service can be another one. You know, they need support. They need help, and so I'm going to have this relationship. Fun can be a reason. You know, we, we like to hang out. We like to have fun together. Or support, I am needy, I need help, and so I'm seeking this kind of relationship. Maybe it's a professional reason. I want to learn and grow in my industry, and I'm going to have relationships that help me do that. Shared hobbies. Not, it's not merely fun, anything that's fun, but maybe that, you know, I think about a book club, or you get, you get together and play golf on a certain day of the week, or you meet at the game and watch the game together. Shared hobbies, we do these activities together. Mentorship, you might say. They, this is somebody who needs my instruction or experience or advice. Maybe it would be sharpening, what we would call sharpening, which is a, a mutually beneficial and stimulating relationship. And there are many other priorities that we can have. And I would say it'd be, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be helpful and interesting for you to examine yourselves and, yourself and see what kind of priorities you have for choosing the relationships that you do. And if you've never done that, you'll learn a lot about yourself, good or bad. Why do I choose the relationships that I choose? What, what are the priorities that I have? What am I hoping to get out of them or put into them? Do we have the right priorities in those, in those uh, relationships? Do those priorities need to be adjusted? How do we know? Similar to buying a house, how do you know? Well, when you begin relationships, do you stay true to your priorities? If we don't keep the, pro the right priorities in the right place, we end up in the wrong place. And here's some examples. You may start out at a new job by hoping to be a witness to your coworkers but you end up merely trying to fit in and be liked by them. And this will result in you not standing for truth or for Christ. You might want to marry someone who loves and serves God, but then your priorities change and you end up picking someone and marrying them because they're attractive to you and, and they like you. And this can result in a marriage that isn't centered on the Lord. Maybe your priorities about a job, you want a job that permits you to be in church and serve in church ministries, but then you end up picking a job because it pays a lot of money, and that results in you serving your employer instead of serving the Savior. You may want to use your life to please the Lord Jesus Christ by doing anything he asks of you, but you become enamored with a certain career field or a certain leisure activity, and this results in you choosing your future instead of God, taking you out of God's will for your life. We can have priorities at the beginning, and then, we, and then they can change. And they might change for the better, if we have bad priorities or, or lesser priorities, but they can also change for the worse, if we're not careful. And so we need to ha ask God to help us have and keep right priorities in our life, including in our relationships. And some of these scenarios that I mentioned have to do with relationships. But keep the right priorities in our relationship pertaining specifically tonight to fellowship. 
And so how do we have the right priorities? How do we build and maintain fellowship? Fellowship that pleases and honors God. Fellowship that fits the scriptures. Fellowship that, that adds to our life instead of draws us away from, from the Lord and things of the Lord. How do we have those right priorities in our fellowship? Well, here are some things for us to consider tonight. First of all, focus on important things. Keep the main thing the main thing. You've probably heard that statement before. It's a very simple idea. What should be the main thing? Well, if you're going to focus on important things, that starts with right doctrine. The word doctrine means anything that is taught. We can believe doctrine. Oh, I believe doctrine. You believe doctrine. Is it the right doctrine? Uh, we must believe not wrong doctrine, of course, but hold fast, believe and hold fast to right doctrine. Keep that the main thing. The word orthodox has kind of been, I would say, in some ways hijacked by false religion. But the word orthodox is not a, it's not a bad word. It's not a wrong word. It just means right doctrine, right teaching. Sound, or, the word orthodox means soundness of faith, a belief in the genuine doctrines taught in the scriptures. Let's, let's focus on that. Let's keep that the main thing in our relationships, in our fellowship. I think about Psalm 1914, which is a very good verse. It's familiar to us all. It, it gives us a good focus for our lives. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And maybe we could characterize it and say, how do we keep our relationships having the right priorities, our fellowship having the right priorities? Well, Keep this relationship our highest priority. That's how, we, that's how we do it. And how do we do that? By following what this says, what the Word of God says. Our relationship with the Lord should be first. Our words, our heart, the meditation of our heart needs to be acceptable in the Lord's sight. I'm reminded of Acts 2, 41, which says, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Of course, we know it, wasn't, it didn't originate with the apostles. It originated with Christ. Christ taught it to them, and they're teaching it to others. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Keep the main thing the main thing. Focus on important things. Not lesser things. Let's, let's keep the priorities in the right order. And that begins with right doctrine. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says to this church in Philippi, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Sometimes we can have fellowship and then one, one or both parties in that relationship start to drift and right doctrine starts to be disregarded and we make excuses because we know them or they know us and it's no big deal and now we're drifting into an area where we're not glorifying the Lord with our fellowship. Sometimes we can say, well, I, I believe in right doctrine until we meet somebody that we really like on a human level but they don't hold to that doctrine, and so we throw out doctrine so that we can have that relationship, and we're changing our priorities. We're not, we're not focused on and, and holding fast to those right priorities. But Paul talks about this fellowship in the gospel, and if the gospel is still the main thing in your life, fellowship in the gospel is a sweet and precious thing. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. It's amazing to me how... When life gets difficult, and, and I think about Peter writing to, and specifically in 1 Peter, he's writing to people who are being afflicted and, and persecuted. And when life gets tough like that, you really start to value uh, fellowship that is predicated on the right things 
far above fellowship predicated on the wrong things, and it becomes a little bit easier to value scriptural and God-honoring fellowship, but when, when things are easier, we tend to, to let down the, the standard a little bit. We tend to get a little bit lax, but don't forget fellowship in the gospel. Don't forget how God saved you. Don't forget how God has grown you. Don't become independent from those things and how the Lord did it. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or, or twist and pull away, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Last week we looked at how our associations and our relationships can pull us away from right doctrine if those relationships are, are predicated, that fellowship is with people who do not believe right doctrine. We ought to minister to the lost. They're not holding right doctrine or they'd be saved. And so we're ministering to them, but we're not fellowshipping with them. We are being a blessing to them and seeking them and helping them and serving them, but we are not fellowshipping with them. When we fellowship with somebody, we open up our heart and allow them to, to affect us. And if they hold wrong doctrine, it will hurt us and change us and, and um change how we think and how we live. Second, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That Peter is saying, as newborn babes desire the milk that they need to eat and grow, you should desire the sincere milk of the word just as much as babies desire that milk. This desire is not a negative thing. It's not a negative context. When I read this verse, I, I often think of Paul's reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, talking about babes and, and milk. And he says, I've fed you with milk. I can't feed you with strong meat from the word of God. I have to feed you with milk because you're not mature to understand and that's not what Peter's referring to here. He's talking about the desire for Scripture, the desire for the Word of God. And you and I all, always and continually, as we go on in life, ought to always desire the Word of God so that we can grow, just like newborn babes desire that. If we stay dependent on the Word of God like a newborn baby is dependent on milk, that baby is dependent completely, there's no other food source, and and frequently, the baby is often hungry. And moms are saying amen to that. We will hold fast to right doctrine if we need the word of God that way. Boy, you know, it's been most of a day and I haven't been meditating on the word of God. I haven't been reading. The word. I need to get back to it. I need to think about it. I need, to, I need to recite the verses I've memorized. I need to study. I need to sit down. I need to pray. I need to, to look at the word of God and ask God to teach me. If we have that kind of desire and love and dependence on the word of God, we will have the right priorities, the love and practice of right doctrine is essential in fellowship. If it's going to be God-honoring fellowship, you need to love and practice right doctrine. As soon as we start to think, you know what, I've got it. It's on, I know it like the back of my hand. I don't, need to, I don't need to seek this anymore. I don't need to refresh it. I don't need to, to act as if there's something else for me to learn. I've got it. I know the dog. I know it. As soon as we start thinking that, we're already opening ourselves up to fall, opening ourselves up to destruction. There's always something more that we need to learn and grow in, become more like the Lord. And so we need this scriptures. We need this. It should be the top priority in our relationships, beginning with our relationship with the Lord. 
focus on important things. That begins with right doctrine. Secondly, an important thing that we should focus on is work on the person in the mirror. If you're going to have God-honoring fellowship with another party, another person, um, you work on the person you see in the mirror every morning. If you stay in the Word, and if you are honest with yourself regarding the Word of God, you won't ever run out of things that need to change. There will always be something more that you you and I need help with. And here are some some thoughts about that. It's okay for us to be under construction. It's okay to admit that. Sometimes we get get proud and we want to come to church and act like everything's polished. And I mean, I'm not saying I'm sinless like God or anything, but I mean, this is a pretty finished product, right? And we wouldn't even say that. We, we know better than to say that. But it's okay to, to admit to yourself that, you know what, I'm still working on such and such. I still fa- I failed at that this morning or yesterday. You know, I just didn't respond the way I should have. I'm under construction. I'm, still, work- I'm still, still improving. I've still got things to work on. It's okay to be under construction. The phrase, practice what you preach, doesn't mean never fail or make a mistake. It doesn't mean that. It does mean that you don't excuse your sin and that when you do sin, you'll repent and apologize and restore whatever's needed. Practice what you preach. It doesn't mean you don't ever make a mistake, but it does mean you're honest about your sin. You don't excuse it and you make it right. You repent and, and so on. Work on the person in the mirror. Beseech God to show you areas for improvement. God, show me, show me what I need to, to grow in. Show me, show me what I'm not doing right. Show me how I need to improve. Please, show me that. It's, it's painful, but it's good for us to ask God to do that. He'll always do that. And, and the way he does it is he opens up an avenue for us to follow to improve, not simply condemn and criticize us. That's how the devil works. The devil condemns you. The devil criticizes you. The devil tears you down. The devil tries to defeat you. He wants to discourage you. He wants us to give up. God doesn't do that. He he shows us our faults, and it does hurt, but it doesn't discourage us. If If our heart is right before God, it actually encourages us and excites us because I want to stop being what I am right now, and I can, and I know how, and God showed me, and so let's go do it so I can stop being what I am at this particular moment. God does condemn our sin and he knows how to humble us but he always opens up a path onward and upward if our desire is to follow that he knows how to show us how to improve another way that you can work on the person in the mirror is to be encouraged with progress instead of looking for a rival or perfection if you are expecting perfection if you're expecting uh, you, yourself to arrive and reach the destination and, and all of this, then you'll either get discouraged because perfection is impossible or you'll become proud because you think you've arrived. And neither of those things is what God wants for us. Instead, we can expect what God has promised to do in us. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Work on the person in the mirror. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. There is plenty to work on without ever leaving the bathroom, looking at the mirror. The guy, the the gal in the mirror, there's plenty to work on there. And you'll, you'll have all you need and more to focus on and change We don't need to to look much farther than that in order to be occupied. And that will prepare us and help us to better engage in fellowship. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. There have been times where 
where I do something or I say something and God immediately says, you know what, you shouldn't have done it that way. That, you, you should have done this instead. Oh, yes, you're right, Lord. And it doesn't discourage me. It says, let's do that better next time. And when we respond, it's a, it's, it's a growing thing. And we can look back. I'm so glad God showed me that. I'm so glad he, 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 he helped me improve and helped me to see, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. But when we focus on ourselves and we look at ourselves, and I've talked about looking in the mirror, not because to focus on ourselves. You understand what I mean? But if we behold ourselves and, and we are proud and full of ourselves, then any attack, any criticism that somebody might have is very offensive and we're going to lash out. We're not going to be ready to grow. We're not going to be humble to, to admit and to apologize and so on. We're focused on other things instead of ourselves. The Lord has, the Lord has shown me the truth of this in my own life, that if you will occupy yourself with letting God conform you to his word you will have your hands full with your own shortcomings and you won't have any time or desire to focus on the shortcomings of others. That is a big benefit and help to fellowship. You'll be humble about your failures and you'll give grace to others in theirs. Because I need to be careful about criticizing another saint, another child of God, because that person is God's servant, not my servant. I need to be careful. But if I'm focused on what God wants to do in me and my failures and my areas that I need to grow in, I'm going to stay humble and I'm going to say, hey, that's okay. You're welcome to be a sinner because I'm one of those two. I understand I'll give you grace in that. Doesn't mean we excuse and overlook sin, but we give grace so that other people can grow and be right. Matthew 7, 3, it says, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. It's, it's amazing how often we can overlook our own issues because we're so focused on somebody else's. But if we will be humble and focus on what God wants to do in us, and we're thankful for what he's doing in our lives, then we can appreciate others for the good things that they are, and not the good things that we wish they were. Boy, you know, if they would just fix that, that's a critical spirit. But when we give grace to others, we'll say, oh, yeah, you know, they did or said that thing. I was hoping maybe they'd do something else. But you know what? I'm, I'm really thankful for this thing that they did. I didn't expect them to do that. They said this to me. I had no idea they were going to say that. That was, a real encourage, that was a real blessing. That was a real help to me. We can be satisfied with the, the, the relationships that God has given us, have this satisfaction. And that kind of satisfaction is very important in fellowship. Again, if I'm, if I'm pointing out and being critical and thinking about everything, I'm just looking for a chance to tell them how they're wrong. I'm, we're not fellowshipping. That's more of an adversarial relationship. If we're going to have fellowship, I need to be focused on, on my own problems, focused on the important things. It begins with right doctrine. Work on the person in the mirror. Thirdly, edify and encourage and exhort others in truth. We're not, you know, somebody could try to rephrase these points and, and take them farther than I mean them. You know, right doctrine. Um, I don't know how you'd take that wrongly, but work on the person in the mirror. I'm not going to help anybody. I'm just focused on me. No, it doesn't mean that. We are to edify others. We are to encourage others. We are to exhort others, but in the right spirit, to be a help. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. It is good to sharpen others. If fellowship does not influence others and influence us to do what's right, it is deficient. God uses people to help others. But if we are not where we ought to be personally, we cannot help others like we should. Kind of going back to getting the beam out of your own eye. 
But if we are where we ought to be, then we should edify and exhort, but not condemn and criticize. And, and we'll talk about these, the, what these words mean a little bit and how we can do it in humility and in love. It's easy for us to be impatient. We prefer shortcuts, don't we? I think this way quite often. I'm driving from point A to point B. What's the shortest route? How can I avoid the most lights? How can I, you know, slow down to avoid traffic? And I want to just get there quick as possible. What's a shortcut? Oh, there's a train coming. How can I go around? All these different shortcuts, and we can do that in relationships too. You know, I, I just tell it like it is. That can be a shortcut, and it's usually not very helpful. You know, I, I, I just tell it like it is. I'm just blunt. That is often code for, I don't want to conform my communication to what others need it to be. I just want to say that the way I want to say it. And if you don't like it, well, I'm just blunt. You'll just have to accept that about me. Here's a question. Does God want me to be blunt? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Does God want me to be blunt? Maybe bluntness doesn't edify or encourage. Maybe it just tears down. I'm not saying you should never be blunt or that bluntness is always wicked. I'm just saying I think sometimes we excuse ourselves and we shouldn't. We need to edify. Turn over to Romans chapter 14. What does that other person need? What do they need? Not what do I want to tell them. What do they need? And if we think of it that way, I think it will change our speech and help us have better fellowship, God-honoring fellowship. We need to edify each other. The word edify means to build, to improve. And it's so easy. I am talking from experience. It is so easy to just look at what needs to change. And I'll go change it. If they would just change it, boy, they'd really be in good shape. But when somebody comes to you like that or me like that, we don't like it. It feels hurtful. It's, it's offensive. It's, it feels uncaring. But we excuse ourselves when we approach others like that because we focus on what we want to change. Instead, we should edify, which means to build or improve. Romans 14, verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. And maybe there's a little bit of fear. Well, what if I don't tell them their fault? They're going to go off and do whatever. Well, maybe that's right. And, and I'm not talking about don't warn somebody. Don't warn them of, of destruction coming. But I think too often we take that and say, well, I'll just go tell them what they need to fix. And fixing them is not our job. We should let God take care of that. And instead, we should seek to edify. And we'll do a lot, a lot more good if we edify. Others, others may not agree with our message. If our message is scripture, this is how I want it to be in my life when I'm witnessing when I'm talking to others, seeking to edify, exhort, so on, they may not agree with my message. And if that's the case, I hope that my message is Scripture. I hope that the reason they don't agree with it is because they don't agree with Scripture. But we should not cause objection with our manner. Boy, they said the right thing, but with a terrible attitude, with a critical spirit, with an angry spirit, whatever it is. May, may we not cause objection with our manner. Edification is a positive and a building process. It's amazing to me how we can, we can give the gospel and tell people about the, the, um, the condemnation of their sin in a way that doesn't discourage them. I was reading a prayer letter from one of the missionaries that we support today, and he was talking about how there's a man who... who uh, is trained and was brought up in the Catholic religion, he was witnessing to him. And as he was witnessing to him, the missionary witnessing had tears running down his face because he cared about this man's soul. 
And, I, and I've been in, I, I've experienced something similar at times. And that touches people. They can see, you know, you're giving me scripture that condemns my sin, but your spirit is not critical. Your spirit is not condemning. Your spirit is not one that discourages. It can be edifying, even though it might be a negative message for those who love their sin. This is how we ought to, to engage in fellowship, to edify each other. We must continually encourage. The word encourage means to give courage to, to give or increase confidence of success. I love that definition because if we're thinking right, we know the confidence of success doesn't come from me. I, I, I don't have any ability to do God's work. I, I, if you're depending on me to do God's work, it's not going to happen. Let's just get that out of the way right now. If I'm depending on me to do a spiritual work, I already know it's going to end in failure. But confidence of success is in the Lord. And so I know that I can't do it, but if, if, if we encourage each other in the Lord that he's going to give success, we have confidence and success in him, and that is encouraging. That does help us to go on. I know it's going to happen, not because of you or me, not because we're smart. God's in control, and that is encouragement. We ought to encourage each other. Don't stop. Here's a way to encourage somebody. Don't stop what you're doing because what you're doing is good. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying you never made a mistake. I'm not going to focus on what I wish were different. I'm going to encourage you in what, what you are doing right. Encourage you in the one you are following. Confidence of success. If you try, you can find something to encourage somebody about. It can be found. I think about Deuteronomy 138. Moses is speaking to Israel. He says, But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. In Joshua chapter 1, God encouraged Joshua. And he said, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm, I'm going to go before you. No man shall be able to stand before you. That was a lot of encouragement. But I'm sure Joshua needed more than that because there were a lot of battles. There were a lot of kings. There were a lot of armies that they fought. And we could say, well, you don't need encouragement. You got it once. You should be fine. Yeah, if we were sinless, if we always thought right, yeah, maybe that might be true. But God, God remembers our frame. He knows we're dust and he gives us encouragement and we need to encourage each other too encourage each other. God's going to give success. Let's follow him. Let's go on. We also need to exhort each other. Exhort, exhort means to incite by words or advice, to animate or urge by arguments to a good deed or any laudable conduct or course of action. Sometimes we wonder, is what I am doing any, doing any good? Is it really getting anywhere? Am I just spinning my wheels? Or maybe we wonder if the goal is worth attaining. Is this really worthwhile? But we can exhort each other. Yes, it is. Don't give up. Inspire others. Don't tear down with criticism. Exhort instead. God doesn't need our help to point out somebody's flaws. And sometimes, I would say most often, he'll use our words. If he uses our words to do that, to point out someone's flaws, we don't, we're not even aware of it at the time. We didn't even know he was using it that way. We don't need to sort of uh, go on a seek and destroy mission with somebody else's problems and issues. Let's exhort, let's edify, let's encourage. Focus on important things. If we will feed and water our fellowship, feed and water, so to speak, tend, tend to and care for this fellowship with right doctrine, with humility, with edification, encouragement, and exhortation, we'll find that both sides in the relationship will be greatly helped. Engage in fellowship this way. Focus on important things. Briefly, let's look at a couple other things. After focusing on important things, let's ignore and overlook unimportant things. Talked about a critical spirit seeking flaws and obsessing over, over them. That destroys fellowship. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body and different members of the body. And some members are comely and others are ugly, but they all have a purpose and they all need each other and they're all important and they all comprise the whole. And you and I need to appreciate each other's strengths and differences. None of us have all the strengths and no weaknesses. And none of us have all the weaknesses and no strengths. None of us have all the gifts and none of us have no gifts. We all need and, and, and benefit from each other. And so let's appreciate those things. Let's overlook the, the struggles. Let's give grace to, the, to others in their mistakes or struggles because we have them too. Of course, it doesn't mean that we should ignore unrepentant sin. 1 Corinthians 5 talks about a man who was engaged in some immoral, uh, immorality, immoral behavior, and Paul was writing to correct them. That church was not judging that sin. They were overlooking it. They had sacrificed right doctrine. So overlooking someone else's struggles does not mean forsaking and neglecting right doctrine, but it does mean that we give grace when somebody isn't perfect, when somebody is trying. If we judge our own sin, we should not be judged, and we should let others judge their own sin as well. Maybe, you, maybe you'll see a, a concern, you have a concern about somebody else, you know, they, they don't do something quite right, or they don't seem attentive to something, and, and you, you want to just go fix them. Take your t- concerns to God instead of into your own hands. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I think if, you, if you're wondering whether or not you should go to somebody and point out something, if you say, I'm going to be extra cautious about this because this is kind of a serious thing and it might hurt them, it might defeat them, it might discourage them, it might make them feel like maybe they should give up, I'm just going to wait and pray about this. I'm going to see if God will do this without my help or if he'll, he'll just make it absolutely clear. If, we, if we're extra cautious that way, I think a lot of times we'll find that God just did it and we didn't even need to get involved. And he did it much better than we could have. By focusing on what's truly important and ignoring what isn't truly important, overlooking it, we'll build strong, God-honoring, spiritually profitable fellowship relationships with our fellow church members. Let's keep the right priorities at the top. We'll end up with fellowship that gives joy and sweetness to life and helps us do and be more for Christ. Let's talk real briefly about maintaining fellowship. Just like a home needs to be maintained, relationships need to be maintained. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. There's some maintenance there. Every relationship, every relationship needs maintenance. Are you maintaining yours? Here are some ways to do it. Grow and improve and develop your relationships. Lethargy and complacence are constant threats to our relationships. We know that in a garden, weeds need pulling. Things always need to be repaired. Parts need to be replaced. Wounds need healing. These are ways to maintain and develop and grow our relationships. So Philippians 2, 4, in lowliness of mind, 2, 3, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Develop your relationships, grow them. Develop your love for God and truth. If we love God, turn to John chapter, then it will help our relationships. The more you love the Lord, the more your relationships will benefit. John 14, let's look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So God is, Christ is saying, you should love me first. Notice how this continues here. Chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. 15, 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So now it's not just loving Christ. We ought to be loving each other, but we can't love each other properly if we don't love Christ first. 
15, 17. These things I command you, that ye love one another. This love for God, is, it, our love ought to be for God and for truth first, and love for each, for each other second. And that brings true unity and fellowship. John 17, look at John 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This is all the same evening that Jesus is saying all these things. Love me first, love each other, and that's going to bring unity. Unity as the Father and the Son have, unity with each other, that's fellowship. And the result is the furtherance of the gospel, that the world may believe that God the Father sent Christ. Develop your relationships. Develop your love for God and truth. And lastly, live purposefully every day. This is how we maintain fellowship. Live purposefully every day. We, we understand trying to do what's right, but living purposefully, I, I mean more than just trying to do what's right. I'm, I'm talking about a vision and, and a, an eye to the future, where my actions will take me down the road. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the way of, ways of death. We can think we make a good choice today and not realize where it takes us. Proverbs 14, 15 says, the, believe, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Psalm 25, 12, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. We need to depend on God every day. Live purposefully. I'm going to make choices today. I'm going to, I'm going to do, grow relationships today. I'm going to walk with God today. I'm going to... I have, Somebody was recently asking me to pray for them. They have decisions coming up. Where are these decisions going to take me? I'm going to use my day for a certain thing. Where is it going to take me? Because the decisions you make in your life is going to affect the relationships that you have. This is how we grow and maintain fellowship. I'm going to seek out that person today. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to find out how they're doing. I've talked a lot about self in in other words being more christ-like and it might be surprising to us to think about our fellowship with others being so affected by how we live inwardly but when our own lives are brought into subjection to christ it will improve our fellowship with others because fellowship is a spiritual gift from god we enjoy god's blessings most when we're fulfilling his will for our own lives personally. If we go chasing after these relationships or these scenarios or these things, we're putting those things first, and all the spiritual blessings that we could enjoy are going to be deteriorating and, and going downhill in our lives because we don't have any spiritual blessings unless God gives them to us. Let's take the necessary time to build and maintain fellowship with others. It starts by being what God wants me to be, believing what I ought to believe, love what I ought to love, and then letting that flow out of me and helping others, putting others ahead of myself to build them up, exhort them, will not regret building and maintaining this fellowship. It takes work. It's an investment. But helpful and God-glorifying fellowship is worth the investment. It's a great blessing, a great, a great boon and an addition to our lives. It's worth the work. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to develop and maintain this fellowship. You give us so many things, and, and you gift us with sweet fellowship, but sometimes we don't, we don't maintain it. We don't keep it up. We don't take care of it. We neglect it. We get distracted, and we become selfish Help us not to be that way. Help us to appreciate what is truly valuable and invest in maintaining those things. I pray that you would be glorified in our fellowship with each other. We don't put each other first. We don't put ourselves first. We put you first. And we want our relationships, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, we want it all to please you and to bring glory to your name. And I pray that our fellowship would do that as well. 
We pray that you would help us in this area. Help us to give grace to each other. Help us to seek you for help and grace in our own lives to be what we ought to be. I pray that you'd be glorified in this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for your attention this evening. You're dismissed. Remember the meeting, short meeting in the Learning Center immediately. Thank you.